All right, everybody, welcome to this week's installment of The Grumpy Old Men, starring Kurt Bavakwa, 15-year Major League Baseball player. How you doing, Dirty Kurt? So, What's so now, now I'm getting a social media post, uh, being invited to join About? the crabby old women. What's up with that? What? <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. The crab, the crabbiest what? old women, or something like that. I'll, I'll find it and tell you. Yeah, I've been, I've been. Invited, That's a thing. I've been invited to join that. Uh, two or three times in the last couple of days. Well, see, that's why my name is Hank Bauer. I, of course, um, did not play for the Yankees. I have not been dead for 20 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the other. That's the original. That's a bad Hank Bauer. Bad as in good. That's the original Hank Bauer that played with Mickey Mantle and all those guys with those great Yankee teams. That's right. Um, I'm the one that played for the Chargers. Yeah, play, I played for the Chargers. I coached the Chargers. I broadcast Charger games. Oh, about 20, 29 years worth, I guess, Kurt. Um, and then uh, for the last four years, I've been broadcasting games, NFL games on national radio with Larry Kahn and Sports USA Network. So now you know who we are. Um, and wow, uh, the NFL season, speaking of which, Kurt. Is over. Finally over. Yes. And, and, and could there be? Could Sunday have been a bigger dud? Oh boy! I mean, it's the. Could, there, could there, was nothing, there was nothing good about that. I didn't even find one of the commercials great, which normally is none. What I go for the halftime show was brutal. I mean, I don't know what the hell happened there, because normally halftime shows are really good. Hey, wait, stop, stop right there. Let's bring in John Brown or our producer JB. Explain to Kurt, who may not be as hip as us, because he's grumpy. I'm the happy part of this, and you're the younger version of this. Hey, I don't have any John problem Brown. with the weekend. I know who the hell the weekend is, but I don't want to listen to him for 20 minutes. He's not Jennifer Lopez and Shakira. That's all there is to it. And what the hell was the white face? Okay, so me, John, explain to me the white face. What was going on with that? I I can't explain to you something. I have no idea what was going on. Some okay. things just miss everybody. And, and I think thing, uh, I don't know, COVID protection during the Super Bowl, who knows? A Canadian thing? They were damn Maybe. bad. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, is he from Canada? Yeah, he's from Toronto. Oh, see, I didn't know that. So, hey, tell me what his real name is, too. I have no idea what his real I See, to me, I thought this was a mistake when they picked him. I thought I knew his halftime show was going to be a dud because he's big because of people he gets on his music. He's not big because of his music. And that's a huge difference when you start talking about somebody like J-Lo, who's big because of her music, not because of the people who she has on her music. Any guy that this guy could have had from one of his songs would have overshadowed him because they were bigger stars than him. So they did, So that's probably why he didn't do it. Let me, let, let me just say this. I think... For me, at least, I, I, I've been thinking about why did that strike out? Because I thought the guy's got an amazing voice. He's an unbelievable performer. The, you know, the whites and the New York setup and the staging, that was all phenomenal, like it is every year. But I'll tell you what was missing. I'll tell you what was missing. The same thing that's been missing all season long. When I go to broadcast all of these games, when I go to Denver, which is an unbelievable place, for the Broncos to have a home field advantage. When I go to Seattle, the last game or second last game against the Rams, right? And and it's empty up there in Seattle. And and I'll tell you what was missing. The, the energy from the fans, right? Not only for the game, but for the halftime show, right? Normally, you know, even the pregame show, when they cut away to who was performing in the pregame show that was at SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles. Uh, one of the headline performers. The country right? was, uh, no, no, it was, it was somebody else. But regardless, it was a big name entertainer. This is how big it was. I don't even remember. Um, but there was nobody there. Was an, they were in an empty stadium at SoFi. Same thing I broadcast in front of for, for, for 17 weeks this year. People underestimate the energy 
of fans and the impact of crowds. You guys agree to that? I mean, to me, it changed the entire vibe. I mean, it, it, you know, from the pregame show to the postgame show to the game itself, you know, you know, they, they had 25,000 fans in there with a bunch of stupid cutouts, right? They had piped in noise. Okay, if I never hear piped in noise again, I'm good. <laughs> that that I'm halftime laugh of show Hank, would have been great. Yeah. The halftime show would have been great if Shakira was on it again. Okay. That's all so, there is. So, to okay. Fans or no fans? Uh, no. You know, I what are you don't talking know. about. I, I, I just think that I think that that we are underestimating. We're under underestimating the impact of fans. I think we are. Uh, the, 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 would you okay. want to play? You know, I would not. It's better to play. There's nothing better to going into a, a, a like I used to love to go to play play the Raiders in Oakland, right? I would love it from the time you got your Absolutely. buses roll in, Kurt, and you can hey, you stick your head out the window of the bus and you smell the ganja from the parking lot and it's all silver and black and it's all look it looks like it look like it was a get out of prison day you know <laughs> every every ex-con every women are tatted up all over their faces you know and they're, they're they look as gangster as the guys and you know what they're they're all great fans they're great people i love raider fans in fact this dirty little secret if i could have played for any other team the raiders that's like you saying you'd play for the Dodgers, right? But I would have played for the Raiders, honest to goodness, um, because I think I think uh, that that they do it right and their fan base does it right. Well, it's the same thing in Tampa. I've been to Tampa when it's sold out, and and people are rocking on that ship and and everything else. I think that that was the first thing. Um, the second thing is for me, and and I said this with Scott. And, and, and JB and Alex earlier this week, Kurt, I don't know about you, but for me, from a football perspective, I was really looking forward after all we've gone through, all of us with COVID, right? And how it's taken people's jobs away. More importantly, it's taken lives away, right? How, how it's impacted us all, how it's worn us down. Uh, you can't go out to eat. You can't go out and, and worship together. You can't, you know, work out together indoors. You can't do this. You can't do that. And and I think that after a year of that, it's almost been a year, okay? I was worn down. Kurt, I wanted three and a half hours to be entertained, okay? The game, to me, most people say it sucked. It was boring because it was one-sided. I loved it because I loved the game. And I was, you know, the X's and O's. I was watching the individual battles. Why was this being? How are the how are the officials calling the game? You know who is winning? Why is this happening? What kind of adjustments are they making with the game plan? See, I see the game a little differently, but I wanted to just be taken away for three and a half hours. And you know what I felt like? I felt like I felt today when I turned the stupid TV on, and I'm watching the. I try to turn the local news on, and there's the impeachment hearings. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I'm tired of it. Okay, I'm tired of hearing about COVID. I'm tired of of, of impeachment. I'm I'm tired of this. And every commercial, I wanted to be entertained. I wanted to go. Wow, that was really funny. That was creative. That was cool. No, it seems like everyone, subliminally or not, had some kind of message or political uh, connection. And and it, just the whole thing wore me down. It did. And and goodness gracious. Thank goodness it's over. But all of that said, it's still it was still it was still for me, it was still good because I love the X's and O's. If I for all the other reasons though, that was terrible. It was it was awful. Well, like my good friend said, and you know him, Craig Shoemaker, he's never been so happy for the weekend to be over. <laughs> <laughs> So, thank, thank goodness for Monday. It's, it's, it's hey, over. by the way, it's over. And, and congrats, it's over. Yeah, it's over. I mean, it was a blowout. Uh, Tom Brady shows who he is. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, I didn't, 
his uh, his offensive he line was, kind of first, first, first of all. Bit. First of all, he was hurt. He he wasn't explosive as as a runner as he was all year. As a bad toe, he's getting surgery on his toe, big toe. That's that's brutal, you know. And you could tell if it slowed him down just a smidge. That was just a smidge too much, mm-hmm. right? And 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 uh, you know, it just uh, the the game itself. Did you watch any of? Today, did you watch any of the boat parade in Tampa? No. Okay. I was worried. So, obviously, okay, so I wasn't. So, <laughs> so obviously. The boat parade? JB, did you watch any of the boat parade today? <laughs> I, didn't I, 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 I did watch the boat parade portions of really? it. Really? I, I thought it was the dumbest thing I've seen in a very long time. <laughs> I feel like it was very dangerous to have that many people drinking and that many people on boats. Look, if you're on a, right? if you're on a float, like in a parade, that was that break, like wheels. That many people drinking, that many people driving boats. Like it was a lot of boats. Apparently, boats are a thing in Florida. I didn't know this. I saw all those boats. I was like, oh my god, it's like boat Armageddon. <laughs> yeah. And Brady's got his his whole family and crew and all his friends and family on his million dollar yacht, right? He's hey, you know you're big when you when you're on your own yacht, right? Your own two million dollar yacht. Oh, it's a two million dollar yacht. Oh, yeah. So so here's here here's the thing here's the thing about that. Okay, and this goes back to a story, Kurt, before the Super Bowl that I thought was really downplayed. Um. Well, two things. I want to talk about the diversity of players and coaches, right? And one of the greatest things to come from playing in the NFL, playing in Major League Baseball, you are teammates. You are brothers. You live with these guys for eight months out of the year or or more. You go through ups and downs, and you get the most diverse group of people. Right, Kurt? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I'm, I'm watching – I, I'm, and, and I'm watching these guys on these boats, and I'm thinking Tom Brady couldn't be more different than Vita Vey, right? Vita Vey is this 350-pound defensive tackle, you know, with the with the long Polynesian hair, and he's huge, and and he's smoking a cigar, and he's on the mic, and he's and he's and that's not usually his personality, but you know, he's doing that thing, and then you got Brady over there with his family and his you know in-laws and on his two million dollar yacht, and I'm thinking to myself. How great is a locker room, right? How great is a locker room when nobody like a, like a Tom Brady can only be as good as the lowest paid guy in the roster, right? Because if that guy screws it up, you might lose a game. And isn't that the most wonderful thing about team sports? And 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 I got to tell you, diversity, you know. I, and I want to ask you one story, if you could think about it while I tell mine. Longtime Charger fans, you'll remember guys like Chuck Muncie, like Fred Dean. Okay, both of them have left us. Both of them are with Marty Schottenheimer, hopefully up in heaven, right? So Fred, Fred and I used to, you know, hang out because we had the same agent, right? And and it was Fred and Leroy Jones and uh, Charles D. Janae. So it was three defensive linemen and me that had the same agent on our team. So we would go out every week, and I got to know Fred real, real well. Okay, Fred, Fred, Fred was nuts. Fred was 225 pounds, Hall of Fame defensive lineman, right? Then went on to the 49ers after he left us, won his couple of Super Bowls. Uh, Fred, Fred was 225 pounds playing defensive end, never worked out a day in his life. You'd go in the locker room. He was from, he was from Ruston, Louisiana. Went to college there, Louisiana Tech. Chiseled. I mean, freaking get his clothes off. It's a Greek sculpture, right? It's a statue. Smoking a cigarette nonstop. He used one match a day, butt to butt, right? Throw him away, light up another one, and butt to butt till he went to bed. Drank like a fish. Would go out there, kick everybody's ass, right? Heart of gold, but an absolute maniac terror from down deep down south in Louisiana. But you know what was great about Fred? 
Fred adopted you like a brother in the, in the clubhouse. In the lock, we call it a locker room. You call it a clubhouse. And and Fred, I love Fred, and Fred loved me. I know that. And, but we couldn't have been more different people. And and Fred eventually, the the story is, of course, he went into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I hate when people say NFL Hall of Fame. First time somebody says that, they don't know their ass from a hole in the ground. Pro Football Hall of Fame, right? Um, so so Fred, his last bunch of years, was living down in his hometown in Ruston, Louisiana, Pro Football Hall of Famer, ordained minister, changing lives. So I've never seen anybody change more than that. But the, but, but the message was, and this is what's so great about a guy like Bruce Arians, right? You've got to pull all of these different personalities together. And the great managers, I suspect, the great head coaches in the NFL can do that and get everybody rowing together. Get the Fred Deans rowing with the Dan Fouts, right? So did you have guys like that? Your diverse locker room, I'm sure you guys. Because you get guys from the Caribbean. and We had uh... – well, you you know your um, your numbers are probably a little bit different than Major League Baseball. Um, in the yeah, we had we had we had probably 80, seventy to eighty guys in the in the locker room. Right, right. And how was it split? So you don't have a lot of guys. Uh, from in Trump. You don't have a lot of guys from Korea and Japan. So you basically have white and black. So what was the split? If I was to guess, I would uh, say 70-30, 60-40. Is that about right? Black? Yes. Black to white, yeah. Correct. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely. Uh, definitely. I would say conservatively. Those numbers aren't even clear. I would love it if, if it was, if it had been a more parallel number. But – the biggest the percentage ever got for black um, Americans in the, in Major League Baseball was 18.7% in about 1976 or so. And now it's wow, – I did not know that. Yeah, that was – that's it. And uh, – Hey, Kirk, do you, do you think that – do you think the lack of black people either playing baseball after the 70s or or just kids not picking it up in the in, in the nineties and in the, in the two thousand. Do you think that has hurt the image of baseball across America? A- Any time that you're not putting the best players on the field, I think it hurts the sport, John. The, um, the and I blame the fact that there's not more blacks in Major League Baseball on a few things and. I'm going to put the blame on them as much as the other things. I tell you what, it's certainly not because there's racism involved. That is for damn sure. They have more choices. Um, A lot of them are two and three sport athletes where you see white America nowadays growing up and only being a one sport kid. I mean, they're not letting kids play football and basketball anymore. I mean, my quit, my kid quit playing basketball when he was, uh, when he was a freshman and I really kind of wanted to see him continue to play. I wanted him to have that cross reference on a sport because I think it makes you better in the other sport. So, you know, the fact that the numbers are down for, um, for blacks in major league baseball, the 9%, Hank, how about that number? Nine percent. Uh, now, now does that does that include the guys from like Puerto Rico and all that? Uh, if you got if your skin's dark, they're going to include it. Yeah, absolutely. But they're well. You know what? I take that back. I take that back. That might not be true. I think that in Major League Baseball, I think the numbers are pretty defined when it comes to black, um, Hispanic, and I don't even think we call it Hispanic. I say we. I don't even think they call it Hispanic. I think they uh, it's guys from the Caribbean. I mean, you're going to see that number getting bigger as the years progress uh, over blacks and over white guys 
in Major League Baseball because that's all those kids care about. That's all they know. They're going to continue to play, uh, and we'll continue to talk about it. I mean, it's this is something we'll continue to talk about after the break. All right, let's do that. Okay, it's uh, it's the two grumpy old guys, Hank and Kurt, and we'll be back right after this. <laughs> well, I'm going to bring it back because Hank is just sitting there f- frozen, all all smiles. Look at him; he, he had such he had such a great time the first segment. Uh, talking about how bad the Super Bowl was. And then, and then we got into a real discussion about blacks in Major League Baseball opposed to blacks in the NFL or pro football, as Hank likes to call it. it there's a big disparity. And the blame does not go on the front office of Major League Baseball because they don't want blacks. Uh, nobody, You'd have to beat me forever to get me to, uh, to admit to that because it's just not going to happen. There's no way it's happening. If they can make their teams better, they don't care what color people are. So here's what the bank line is. The black kids are growing up in the atmosphere that they're having to grow up in. They've got parents that might be together and might not. They're growing up in the ghetto. They're getting an opportunity to play either basketball, football, or baseball. What are you going to do? And then they've got. Let me the- present. Let me present to you a, a, another side of that argument. Okay. I'll see what both of you guys have to say about this, but we'll Kurt, you first. The Major League Baseball invests lots of money into the Caribbean. They invest lots of money into South America. They invest lots of money into Cuban baseball. That same amount of money isn't invested within the inner city here in America. And so when I pose that question to you. It's not that the question has so many different uh, ways why the issue is, but I agree with you 100%. The reason why there aren't more black kids playing baseball because black kids aren't choosing to play baseball. I, that's for sure. 100%. I think you make a great point about the amount of money that's being spent in the Caribbean. I mean, there's 18, 19 ball clubs that have facilities in the Dominican Republic. I mean, that, that's not cheap. But I got to tell you something, Browner. They're spending a lot of money on the inner city kids here in the United States also. The there's, RBI program. There's tens of millions of dollars being put into that program, and we're not seeing any fruit coming from those guys. Um, I don't know why. They've got great instructors. Um, you know, I just – I really don't know why, other than the fact that the kids that are – of the caliber of the major league baseball player opposed to a possible NFL player opposed to a kid that can go to the NBA. They're just choosing other avenues. Okay. What do you, you know what I say? Yeah. Best, best person for the job. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what gender you are. I don't care where you came from. If you're the best, you deserve the job, period, case closed. Now, we all know in reality, people calling the shots, look at, yeah, they, they don't look at life that way. You know, they look at who might be affordable. They might have their own agendas, whatever. But for me, I am so sick and tired. I just want the best person for the job. And I will give parents out there this piece of advice. I don't care what neighborhood you're living in, because I lived in a, mostly Hispanic neighborhood in West Anaheim for the be- be- better part of my life. Okay. And, and my advice is a get your grades up because the chance of you playing professional sports are fractional and B play every sport because every sport you play is going to carry over to make you a better player in the other sports. You know, my first love was baseball, Kurt, you know that I grew up with, Gary Carter and I grew up playing baseball in Orange County, right? Um, and and I was a better baseball player than football. But playing baseball helped me in football. It did. It, it helped me think. I was a catcher. I called signals. You know, I was able to – there's carryover values if you play basketball. I, I wrestled, which is I learned about leverage. So my, my advice is eventually kids will choose. You know, find, we need to – what we need to do as a society, though, 
I don't care what neighborhood you're in. Let's make sure everybody has a chance to play all those sports. Right? Let's provide them opportunity. And I think that that's what we should do. By the way, we, we were talking about the boat parade, Kurt. And, and, and JB mentioned all the drinking that was going on on all the boats. You did, too, about how, you know, this Tampa Bay celebration in Tampa today. Do you know that at one point when I came in the league, right, we would – you would come back from games, and we would literally, on our charter flights, have 17 cases of beer, 20 cases of beer. And, guys, you know, it's the end of the week. You're coming down, and guys, guys that would drink, drink. And the guys that didn't, didn't, obviously. But guys that drank, drank. I mean, they partied. And it was provided for us, right? And I'm thinking to myself, wow, do these people not remember that Dallas Cowboy offensive lineman that came off one of those charter flights and tragically got into a car wreck and it was a serious thing? And then I started thinking about Brett Reed, the son of Andy Reed. And – you know, he had a DUI prior. Then last Thursday, he got in that car crash, and and I, I don't have an update on the young two young kids that, that were involved in that on the other side that were impacted. But we're, our prayers are with them. And I'm thinking, you know, that's not the way it is now in today's world. Now I get the season's over, but this is still an NFL and a team function, isn't it? And isn't there because of the liability issues, every flight that I've ever been associated with has been a dry flight every charter because the NFL knows that the team knows that they eventually will be liable if something happens after you provided alcohol to a player who then gets in a crash, right? I mean, that's just what happens. So so I'm thinking to myself, that's all I could think about when I'm watching these guys party and I'm going, please call an Uber, right? You know, please be, be safe. And, and I'm thinking to myself, I see the GM up there drinking beer and Bruce Arians drinking beer himself as well. They should. And I'm sure that they had a designated driver, right? I'm sure they did because they're smarter than that. They're executives. They've got to, especially all that we saw last week. But goodness gracious, I thought, man, I hope that this team, I hope the team is not providing this alcohol. And I, and I pray that nothing happens tonight. Well, just think the only boat parade that was in town when you first started was Ark, the Ark. <laughs> Are you calling me old? You call me no <laughs> grumpy old man. Oh God. Talk for a minute about Marty Schottenheimer, Hank, because he, he just yeah. recently passed away. He was such such a great man, and I uh only spent time with him on the golf course. Uh on a couple of occasions, but I know that you were much closer to him. So talk about Mark. Well, you know, I think that I think that when when all said and done, we're all going to be judged. You know, it's great that Kirk Bavaka played 15 years in the big leagues, but it's more important that that Kirk Bavaka impacted people because of his baseball in a positive way, right? And 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 Marty changed so many lives. There's not I mean, he impacted so many lives in his career. The football part of it, 215 wins, uh, you know, his coaching tree, the impact he had. Think about this. People don't mention this enough about him. There is a reason his guys have gone on to four Super Bowls that worked for him because they learned from him. I'm talking Bill Cowher, right? I'm talking Mike McCarthy, I'm talking Tony Dungy worked for Marty Schottenheimer. People forget this. You know who else worked for Marty Schottenheimer? Bruce Arians, right? And they all took a bit of Marty because we all do that as we coach. And, 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 uh, and, and, and so his impact, even here's a, here's a, here's what sucks. He's in the top seven, most wins, 215 wins, right? But he sucked in the, his team sucked in the playoffs, three and 15 in the playoffs. Is Marty ever going to get in the Hall of Fame? Look at his coaching tree. That's right there with, with Joe Gibbs coming, Joe Gibbs and Ernie Zampese and all these guys that came from Don Coriel, right? And 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 all the guys in the in the Sid Gilman and 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 but is he gonna get in the Hall of Fame? Because he never did well in the playoffs? I don't know. How can you go 14 and 2 with a 
with the team and get fired oh. the next year. Okay, let me just tell you exactly what that was. Yeah, I can't wait. You know, no, I'll tell you exactly what that was. That was a power play between the general manager at the time and Marty, right? And no matter what anybody wants to say, they didn't get along. It, it, they got along to try to win. But, you know, look, it. there's got to be – Fouts wore the hat, MFIC, my friend in charge. Okay, that's my story. Well, now, we all know it's something else, right? It is the mother – something in charge okay there's got to be one mfic in every or great organization or business right in business it's the same way where's the buck stop well there was a power struggle and and eventually the ownership when marty push came to shove because they argued all the time they went back and forth and, and and they were trying you know marty was trying to be the final say the way it should be and aj smith was trying to be the final say and aj couldn't you know he wanted to run it his way and they didn't agree on things so then they'd go back and forth and then they'd go to the owner and does that ever work Kurt no so that's the owner's fault and the owner picked the wrong guy which was AJ okay and eventually AJ won out okay so that's that's how that happens yeah okay so it was it was a power play um yeah we're talking about a lot of deaths lately um not just on this show, but in general. I mean, you you turn on the TV during the daytime and that's all you see on the news is the number of people dying because of COVID. But uh, there was a non-COVID death today in the baseball family, and that was Billy Canigliaro. Uh, Billy Canigliaro, for those who don't know, uh, was the younger brother of Tony Canigliaro, who was – Great White Sox. They were, both, they were both pretty good players for the Boston Red Sox. They both grew up in the neighborhood. Uh, they went to high school uh, in, in a Boston neighborhood. Um, they shared the same outfield. They thought so much of Billy Canigliaro at one time, Hank, that they moved Yaz from the outfield to first base to make room for him. And I'm not talking, I'm not talking about Tony. I'm talking about Billy. I mean, Tony was a rookie of the year. He was the one that had that nasty beanball incident and he came back. And from the time that that poor guy came back into baseball, uh, all he had was health issues. Uh, he ended up retiring. Uh, his brother and him were as close as you can possibly get. I'm talking about Tony and Billy. And uh, Billy was driving Tony to Fenway Park to audition for the analyst job on Boston Red Sox baseball network. And he had a heart attack. Oh my goodness. And uh, he never recovered from that heart attack and he died at a young age. Um, this was going back to, uh, I think that was 1982 that happened. And uh, he died a few years later. Uh, Billy Canigliaro, uh, dead today, age 73. Another baseball brother gone. Way too many well, guys. It comes in threes, right? Pedro Gomez this week, 58 years young. Boy, uh, I, I'm glad you remembered uh, Pedro because uh, the, you talk about a nice man. You know, you meet you meet nice people uh, in the game, and every once in a while there's people that aren't so nice. Pedro Gomez was one of those guys that was a great guy. Uh, I have not – known of one person that hasn't said or uh, known that he was a great guy. Uh, so for him to pass away at such a young age is just a shame. And, you know, ESPN's lost a couple of guys lately. So it's, um, you know, it's, God, it's just not a good time right now. I'm not enjoying life right now. Yeah, but you know, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna lighten it up and I'm gonna yeah. go back to being positive. Do that. So I'm going back, I'm gonna take it back to the boat parade in Tampa today. Oh I'm 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 watching these guys and I'm thinking to myself, you know what I miss, Kurt? You know what I miss about playing? You know, we all miss everything. We we miss all of it, right? We got For the it. most part. You miss the even the crap. Thing. Yeah, yeah. I miss the diversity in the locker room where you know what? We had our own law. We had our own guys that took care of our own sheriffs, our team captains, the leaders, 
we handled our own problems our own way, right? And we had guys like Fred Dean from Ruston, Louisiana. We had guys from the Bronx. We had guys from Chicago. Pete Shaw from Patterson, New Jersey, or from uh, Newark, New Jersey. We had guys from Los Angeles, Hollywood. And you know what? You don't get that in many places, do you? I, I, I liken it. So I liken it, honestly, I think all of our great heroes out there, our great heroes that serve our country, right, our men and women, our women and men, I should say, that serve in the armed forces everywhere for us, they go to boot camp and they're all thrown in together and they're all miserable and they all hate it and they all go through it together and it creates this bond, right, and they unify and they fight for the country and the flag and everything that's right in this country, and that's kind of what it's like for me, it was like for me, to go into this very diverse locker room atmosphere. And I miss that. Let me, I'm going to ask you something. I know what the answer is, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. And, and I'm going to, at the same time, uh, tell people that never once in my 20-some years in the game did I ever see, hear, rumor, anything of guys sitting in the locker room and saying that son of a bitch is in the lineup because he's black. Oh, never. He's playing because he's white. The black guys no. were in the corner. Going, I mean, that's why our games, our profession was so great because there's no black and white. I mean, there really isn't. And I don't think people get that. They really don't. People from outside just don't get it. There was never, I tell you what, I've, tell, I've talked about the fights that I had with Wiggins. It was never a black and white thing. Never thought of by me, and I don't think by Wiggy either. It was never even entered my mind about him being black, and that's why we were fighting. It, okay, so what would happen in today's world and atmosphere? It, It'd be written. I don't think. I don't think that uh, it, it's there in today's world either, Hank. No, no, no. But it would be written about. It oh, would be talked make, about. Sure, they'd make something out of it. I mean, it's they would make either or both of you a racist. Sure. That's just yeah. But it's just, yeah. It's, that's, it's, that's, it is. That's and they are now stupid. Yeah, it's it's, it's just dumb. By the way, I got to tell you, on those team flights, Kurt, did they, did you ever see anything real wild on those charters? What's the wildest thing you ever saw? Oh, I think they stuff one of the stewardesses in the uh, overhead in the overhead <laughs> bin. What? Who did that? I, I don't even remember. Yeah, you do. Might have been. No, I really don't. Might have been Sam McDowell. Because he was like six six, six five, <laughs> and now, now 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 so the fl the flight attendant laughed it off and it was good, right? I know she was pissed. Okay, yeah, no, 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 there was no laughing it off. I mean, I gotta tell, I gotta tell you, one of my two NFL records. I, I we played the Saints clinch the playoffs. I had four carries, three touchdowns, and one yard. And we clinch the playoffs first time for the Chargers in, you know, 15 years. We drank all the beer on the Charger. Here's how crazy it was. Not only did we stop to refuel in Oklahoma City on the way back from New Orleans. <laughs> they brought, they, yeah, they brought on another 17 cases of beer because we clinched the playoffs. Now, that doesn't happen today. Right. All right. This can't go untalked about in this show. Was the Dodgers signing a Trevor Bauer to about a hundred and two million dollar contract? I don't want anybody out there listening to think for one minute that the Dodgers didn't sign Trevor Bauer because they're worried about the San Diego Padres. But I got news for the Los Angeles Dodgers. News. News break right now. It's not going to do any good because Trevor Bauer's a mediocre pitcher. And for the Dodgers to have spent the amount of money that they did on him, unbelievable. Unbelievable. 
the amount of money that they gave Trevor Bauer. Now, did he have a good year last year? Does he have good? Does he have good stuff sometimes? Yeah, he does. But wait until he faces the Padres and Manny Machado goes to the plate with the 650 lifetime batting average he's got against Trevor Bauer. We'll see how that helps. So well, we're gonna see, we're gonna see soon spring training set for a week. From now, all systems are go. The NFL finished the season, so why wouldn't Major League Baseball? Kurt, you were magnificent this week, as grumpy as ever. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and, and I love and appreciate you for being such an a-hole. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 JB, I, I like the effects. I like I like the effects. Yeah. I hope everybody out there got to see them. Well, say good night, Hank. Good night. See you next week. Good- Good night, everybody. What? No, oh, uh, what the heck is this? What? Okay, what? Welcome to this week's <laughs> installment of the Grumpy Old Man. Okay, I'm Hank Bauer. That's Kurt Bavakwa. You're seeing next to one of Kurt Bavakwa's commercials. Way back now, his wife Cynthia posted this this week, right? W- w- would you explain what's going on here, Kurt? She, hey, I don't have anything to do with that. What, what, hey, what the hell was it? What, what, what? It was a what, McDonald's what was commercial. That? It was um, 1985. It was McDonald's commercial, and you could see who was in it. I mean, it was uh, T. Gwynn and Flannery and Carmela Martinez and myself. Now, was that one? Did Ray Kroc own the team at the time? Obviously. Yes. No? Okay, he and Ray, for people that don't know, Ray Kroc was the founder and owner of McDonald's who also owned the Padres, correct, Kurt? That's correct. And it was passed on down when Ray passed away. Joan Kroc took over. Ballard Smith, the son-in-law, was the president and and also on the board of directors of, of McDonald's. So I really never put that... I really never put two and two together on that. I don't think we got that commercial because they own McDonald's. If that was the case, we'd have done a national commercial. That was oh, just that was only local. That was regional. So how did yeah. you get the commercial? So that, is that one of the things where somebody in the front office says you're doing this commercial or, or your agent calls you and says, Kurt, they're going to pay you $100,000 to do this commercial. And, and what did you get paid, by the way? And how long did it take? You know what? I don't even remember. To, I and I'm I'm not kidding. I don't even remember how much we got for doing that. And it took that that particular McDonald's was down in Chula Vista. Why they chose that one, I don't know. But you can see where the uniforms. We went to Jack Murphy Stadium and got got in our uniforms first. You would think. They'd bring us to a a McDonald's in Mission Valley. We got to go all the way to that and do it. And uh, it took us the better part. I mean, oh you can God. see all the choreography you, that's in on. there. Kurt, Kurt, give it up. Did you get paid more than a thousand? I swear to God, I don't remember. I really don't. Oh, come on, Kurt. More, more than 5,000, 10,000? I, I mean, to tell you, I, it wasn't it wasn't 10,000. I would have remembered. Okay. See, because so, I, I mentioned this. And it I wasn't wanted, anything I, I wanted to start. I wanted to start, by the way, because, number one, I loved it. I thought you guys were hilarious, and you guys were good. <laughs> Dancing in your Padre uniforms with Mickey D's. Are you crapping me right now? It was awesome. It was off the charts. And when your wife posted that, I went, oh, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta ambush this. And then then no sooner did I see that commercial, I've got the TV on, and I see Alabama coach Nick Saban doing a commercial for Aflac. Now, okay. Nick Saban, I remember. what is he man? <laughs> what is Nick? And, it's, and I'm going to tell you, 
Okay, no, Nick Saban makes more than $8 million. Guarantee it. JB, John Browner could look it up for us. I guarantee you Nick Saban, yeah, he might be. Yeah, I think he's probably more than $8 million. I, you know, I'm not sure. But no, Nick Saban, what, he's, why he's would you coach us in Alabama? He doesn't coach us Cowboys. Do you not understand Alabama? Alabama? What is it, JB? $9.3 million. There you go. KB, good guess, but more than eight. 9.3. Now, why are you doing why are you doing a crappy commercial? Because he was awful. You know what? Do your job, Bill Belichick. Do your job. Right? Now, I guess the fact that we're talking How about much it, you got Raylan on how bad he was. Yeah, they, they got what they wanted out of it. So I started thinking about commercials and stuff. And you know, I did my fair share of commercials when I was playing, Kurt. I had a car deal. Did you ever? Did you ever have a car deal? Most athletes have car deals, right? Yeah. Okay. Did Chevrolet, you get paid Chevrolet or did you just get Mission Valley? The big one was La Mesa RV, though. I used to do commercials what, for La Mesa what? RV. And you got a free RV, or did they pay you? No, I didn't get a free RV. Okay. I, you know, is. It's just a, a few bucks here and there. If I ever needed an RV uh, for the weekend or something like that, I got one. I took the, an RV to spring training one year. It, it, see, what people don't get is these car dealerships, what they do is, did you have, you probably had to do this too. My, I had a friend, you know, Jimmy Williams, who owned Rancho GP at the time. Right. He says, hey, he says, Hammer, why don't you do a car commercial for me? And I go, JW, for you, I love you. You're like a brother, absolutely. And I and I liked his dealership. I thought it was great. And I ran, you know, Jeep at the time were, you know, the hot deal, right? Cherokees were just coming in. So I did his, I did his, I'll never forget the last thing I did in the commercial was I put my head through one of the windshield and <laughs> broke it out, right? And I looked at the camera and there's no glass everywhere. I go, tough Jeeps, easy prices, right? And I'll never forget that. So the way it works, oh, so we don't get to see that. We get no, to watch don't. me dance in a McDonald's commercial, but we don't get to see that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, 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 and this is a great thing about YouTube. You could probably find this stuff, or you know, on the internet. But so, I had a car deal, and all I did was he got me to get a salesman license, which he paid for, and then I drove a demo car. So I got a new car, whatever he had on the lot, until they sold it. And then they sold it as a gently used car, right? So they never lost money, but he didn't have to give me a car. And I didn't have to assume, and I was insured and everything else. So, man, I drove every kind of Jeep for a while. And then JW sold his dealership. And I was, at the end of my career, I went to work with this, like, Chevy dealer. And, and you know what they gave me, KB? They gave me a Chevy Love pickup. And that's all they'd give me to drive. Same deal, but it wasn't much to do, and I had a free car to drive. Well, it's stupid to own a car if you're a single guy and then have a free car. So I, that's all I had was that car. Well, long story short, I, I break my neck. I have to retire in training camp, right? I announce my retirement. We're at UCSD at training camp. I do the press conference. I walk out after the press conference. Press conference. I'm going to go to the car, go home, get some lunch, and come back to go to work in the afternoon. Couldn't find the car, KB. Couldn't find the car. This is how bad it was. This this freaking dealership. This is this freaking greasy car deal, right? They picked it up. They, he heard that I retired, and they came out and took the car. <laughs> I had no car. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna, most guy, most guys your age that are single driving around in a white van with no windows in it anyway. <laughs> right. So, so that 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 whole that whole commercial got me spinning about car deals and endorsements and hey, believe me, it, it, the way it is now is way different than the way it was back then. Like everything else, you know. Kurt Pavacco played 15 years in the big league. What's the most you ever made in one year playing? My God, how many you've I, I must have said this 15 times on this show already. I know, but I other people remember. might 
Kurt, people may be seeing this for the first time. Oh, that's right. It's not just me and you talking. Oh, yeah, that's I right. Forgot. Okay, so just answer the 180,000. Answer the freaking question, will you? Carry a on. Buck 80. A buck 80. Okay, Let's a buck 80. The- 15 years in the big leagues, and the most I ever made was $180,000. Okay, I got seven years in as a player. Most I ever made two time special teams player of the year for the entire league. You know, the honors dinner that they're having this weekend, the night before the Super Bowl. Not only did I win the award twice and then was a presenter later, most I ever made was $100,000, Kurt. $100,000. Now, I never played for the money because I never got married and divorced like a lot of guys, Kurt, like, and had kids like a lot of guys. And I didn't have a So I, I played, you know, I didn't really care about the money. Money's never been the biggest deal to me. But, but you know, um, these little things were 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 big things, and I and I can't understand Nick Saban nine point three million, and you're making this Affleck commercial, and it's and it's bad. So and and so, so you, it, it, what do you think? What do you think that a guy makes like on those Affleck commercials? I, I, How much is he making? How much is uh, uh, Peyton Manning making? Oh, for those commercials that he does with that country western guy. Well, I'm sure that they've got, you know, got to go do, you know, corporate outings. And it's probably a whole package, right? If it's just taping the commercial, it's got to be seven figures. It's got to be. It's got to be. Nick Saban wouldn't do that crap. But but it's so – Nick Saban, he's like Bill Belichick, right? Buttoned up, you know, straightforward, you know. 400000 400, to record the commercial, and he gets money every time the commercial runs. Wow. So if you're making nine point three million you're ahead of Alabama, would you do it for four hundred thousand and royalties? Every time the commercial airs, he gets paid a, a, a chunk another chunk of money. So that adds up to being way more than a couple million dollars. Okay. okay. But if you if you're making eight point three million as a coach of Alabama. Nine point three. Nine point three million. It's the coach of Alabama, and then you know he's got a shoe contract, right? And other things. Why would you piddle around and look he, like an idiot? He also owns multiple car dealerships in the south in the south uh, east. Well, see now that's a side of Nick Saban I didn't know. I don't know if because c- here's the thing: he's buttoned up, right? He's like Bill Belichick. Belichick. Yeah. Well, have you seen? It? Offer. Have you ever seen Bill Belichick do all this stuff? Any of this stuff? Nope. There you go. So that's the difference, right? I I just I was in shock. some people aren't approachable. Some people aren't approachable. Some people's agents are jerks, and advertising agencies and companies know to stay away from them. Just saying, hey, if we don't have this much money, don't even talk to them. So they don't even go and talk to these guys. Evidently, Saban's got a reputation out there that, hey, if we if we make him an offer, he might take it. So let's let's try. Bill Belichick makes twelve point five million dollars a year. Right, twelve point five. Thank you very much, John Browner. That's the way, why Belichick JJ, doesn't do it. I, we 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 failed to, to to talk about our friend John Browner here who produces this little segment we do, is also a partner on the air. Um, and he's also got a show and a podcast with Bert Grossman, right? Yeah. Yes. And they're on they're on, ten, they're on the radio too, Hank. So would you care to share, JB, about that real quick? Yeah. Uh, it's the Browner and Bert Show. We are on YouTube, same as this one, in a Great Friends Podcast Network, also part of the Captain and Crew uh, YouTube page, what you guys are obviously watching this on right now. And we're also airing on 1090, like this show will in the future, on Tuesdays from 6 to 7 p.m. Awesome. So let me ask you this. Uh, you mentioned YouTube. Uh, obviously, one of the many stories for Sunday's Super Bowl is Andy Reid. Have either of you guys seen the YouTube video 
because Andy Reid grew up in the L.A. area, San Fernando Valley. You know where that's at? You guys know where that's at, right? Um, it, it's yeah, it's kind of – yeah, it, it's just, you know, kind of off the 101 north of Hollywood. It's it's just – so have you seen Andy Reid in the punt pass kick when he was 12 years old? Oh, no. Have you I seen, seen that? JB, no. JB, if you can get that up on your phone and, and, and maybe flip it up here and so people can get an idea. All you got to do, Kurt, wait till you do, it, sit and watch it when you get time. Andy Reid was awesome. – as a 12-year-old in the punt pass kick. Now, I want you to see how big Andy Reid was as a 12-year-old compared to the other kids. Okay? Look at him. Look how big they are. Look at him. That's Andy Reid. Oh, my God. Look at the other kids. <laughs> <laughs> you will never look at Andy Reid the same. I tell you, I would have never known Andy Reid's got to be, what, 60 years old? Oh, he's 68. Great job, JB. Thank you, bud. Can you hit that again? Let's hit that again. Let's hit so that. So he's Let's 68. That Kurt, watch. Look at how big Andy Reid is. 12 years old. <laughs> look at the other kids. No, look at the kid behind him. <laughs> A young Andy Reid. So we're more. So, so when we're watching, how old, when how we're old watching are Andy Reid right now, now? I, he was a 12 year old. Those 12 year olds. <laughs> okay, so that was. 56 years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he looks they like he hasn't the the contest. I can't believe they had it that far back. Right? So so do yourself a favor, you everybody. Go on YouTube and search Andy Reid PPK, Punk Pass Kick. It's hilarious. I just so when you watch the game on Sunday, Chiefs, Tampa Bay Bucks, every time you look at Andy Reid, you're gonna have that visual, right? Just a gigantic. Andy Reid's a hell of a coach. Yeah, he is. We'll find hey, out on Sunday just how good he is. Oh, there's no question. I'll tell you what else. Here's here's the thing. I'll, now, normally Super Bowl week, it's a party every night. It's not like that with the pandemic and COVID and all that stuff. Um, they're still having, you know, some things in Florida is a little different. Twenty some thousand dollars or twenty some thousand people. I guess twenty to thirty thousand people are going to be at the game. Tickets, by the way. That next segment, but impossible to get normally. Great, just forget about it now. Normally, the teams come in five, six days, four, five, six days before they're there all week. There's big press conferences on, you know, Tuesdays, Wednesday nights, and and then they, they you know take turns practicing, and they're there all week. Andy Reid is going to. They're in Kansas City this week. Now, Tampa's practicing in their home facility, obviously, right? Those guys get to right. live at home. Tom Brady's in his 60,000-square-foot house. He hadn't seen his kids and wife for, I guess, 12 days because they've been. she's been out doing her thing, making her supermodel gazillions, and the kids are gone. So Brady's in this big house by himself and will not have seen the kids. I don't even know if they're going to get there before the game. They're going to get there for the game, the whole family in there, obviously. But – but he's got he's in his whole house preparing. The Bucks get to prepare in their home, in their homes, you know, in their home city. They're familiar. And that's a plus, plus, plus. The Chiefs, like all teams, like every team usually comes in like Monday or Tuesday, right? There's the big welcoming, there's the news conferences, both teams on a Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and then it's just they practice at different places, and then the games on Sunday. That's a party they fly out Monday morning. Well, Andy Reid's keeping those guys. They practiced in Kansas City. They're not going out until after practice Saturday. They're flying down to Tampa Bay for one night. And then the game, which starts really late, right, Sunday night. And then they're back out on Monday. So this is so a why Super is Tom Brady separated from – his wife and kids. No, the wife and kids just traveled somewhere. They're just out of town. They're just out of town. You know, they were. They had you go something. out of town a couple of days before the Super Bowl that your yeah, husband's going to play in. What the hell's going on yeah, with that? They're coming back. Hey, Kurt, I I've never dated a supermodel, unlike you. Okay, <laughs> so I, I I don't know what goes on with Giselle Bunchman in her in her clan. Okay. But I thought it was really interesting. 
uh, that, that that's the way they're preparing. Um, here's the other thing, real quick. We got one minute and we're going to take a break. Uh, COVID is never going to go away this year in terms of a story. Two Kansas City Chiefs got haircuts from the same barber. Wide receiver Demarcus Robinson and center Daniel Kilgore. Same barber, right? The barber tests positive for COVID. Now, these guys have tested negative, but they got a quarantine. They can't practice. And as of right now, they can't play until they get like five straight days or whatever it is testing negative. Okay? And they've tested negative. Do you know, think about this, how crazy this would have been. Patrick Mahomes had an appointment with that same barber, as did 20 of the Chiefs players and staff. And this guy tested positive before all those guys could get in and get exposed. Or this thing would be out of control, biggest news, craziest thing ever happened. Off the cuff. Hank, you're a bundle of knowledge, but you're going to have to hold some of it back until this break. We'll be right back, okay. folks.